Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the QT2 podcast series. We're in the series on the coaches of QT2 systems. My name is Reem Jishi, and I'm the content director for QT2. And today, our featured coach, coach is Coach Doug McLean. Welcome, Doug. Hey, thanks for having me. So nice to have you. I know we, you've, you've been with us on the podcast series as a coach a couple of times as part of the My Journey mm -hmm. to Kona series. So mm -hmm. it's nice to just be able to get some time to talk to you and dig into the brain of Doug a little bit more for oh, today. Oh boy, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start you out with where, where I normally do is, can, um, can you tell everyone about how you came to QT2 and about when that was? Yeah, so this was, it was around 2010. Um, I started my own coaching company. It was really small. I had, I don't know, four athletes, something like that. And it was going okay, but I had a hard time marketing. I, I didn't really have like a mentor or anything like that. I was just kind of winging it. Right. Um, and I had this good friend of mine, Ethan, uh, Ethan Brown, some of the old QT tours probably know him. Uh, some of the newer, newer folks don't, but he was an ITU guy out of Massachusetts and he was really good. You know, he's doing all those IT races around the world. And he hired Jesse Kropelnicki as his coach. Uh, and they had a good relationship and all that. And uh, Ethan said, you know, hey, Jesse, uh, my buddy Doug is starting this coaching company. The two of you might get along. You're both engineers, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I think you should interview him and, and maybe potentially bring him on with QT2. And so, uh, yeah, Jesse interviewed me. It went well. Uh, he agreed to hire me, uh, you know, as a coach, I didn't start immediately. I had to go through, uh, QT twos, um, it was like a five or six month training protocol. So, uh, and part of that was I needed to be coached by QT two. So, uh, I had, uh, Tim and Jesse kind of training me how to be a coach. And then I also had Tim who was just coaching me as an athlete. And so then I started taking on QT two athletes in spring of 2011. Okay. So you've been with QT2 now for gosh, 12 years. <laughs> yeah. It's just so, kind of, it, yeah. it's like, I don't remember life without it. You know? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a, that's a good sign. If it's yeah. a good thing and you don't part ways. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, always been good to me. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, um, so I want to back up. I want to, I mean, definitely focus on the coaching piece, but I want to back up as you as an athlete. Um, so mm -hmm. when did you get into the world of endurance sports? Um, I was, I was a bit of a late, I don't know what the right word is, bloomer. That's, that's not the right word, but whatever. Uh, high school, I, you know, just people at my high school didn't really do endurance sports. Like they existed, but they were really low participation. Um, and I just grew up playing ball sports. So in high school, I played, um, basketball and baseball and volleyball and they were fun. Um, I kind of, I, I think about sports like that, like particularly volleyball, like there, there's the, the fun suffering scale, you know, it's like a graph and, and like if Iron Man is down at one corner of the graph, uh, volleyball is up at the other corner because <laughs> there's no suffering and it's pure fun. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I kind of took a funny turn, uh, but then I got to college and it was, uh, you know, my my complete absence of recruiting letters in any of those sports was a sign that <laughs> that maybe uh, you know college baseball was not in my future. Uh, so I got to college. Um, I didn't really intend on doing any sports because I was doing ROTC and that kind of takes up a lot of time. Uh, but then, um, you know, just one of my friends was. I don't know. He, he liked some girl that was trying out for the rowing team. So he's like, Hey, Doug, come to the rowing team, like tryouts, like 200 kids go down. Um, and you just put your name on a list. And I, I actually just went down once, put my name on a list. Um, and then never really thought about it again. And then a couple months later, I got this, this call and an email from the rowing coach asking me what happened to me. I don't know why, like there's nothing special about me, maybe just cause I was like six, three. And so he was just like, you know, cleaning up, going through the list, scanning. Uh -huh. And he was like, hey, Doug, you want to come try this? Uh, and I was like, yeah, sure. Um, and so backstory, my sister uh, was a college rower at Binghamton. And my uncle was an Olympic rower. He won a silver medal in 76. Okay. Um, 
And so kind of rowing is in the family. And so, you know, I did have a little tendency towards it. Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll come try out, you know, even though I missed the tryouts. Um, and I guess I did pretty well. So I ended up getting on the team, uh, did four years um, rowing at Cornell. I set a, a very obscure world record along the way for a hundred kilometers on the rowing machine. It took uh, just under seven hours. Um, <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> I ate, uh, ate power bars and watched Star Wars. Uh, uh -huh. So that was pretty fun, kind of. Uh, and, and we would always do it. We did it every year. And one year I happened to set the world record. And we would do it the day before Thanksgiving break. So it was kind of perfect. Like you do this like insane, I don't know, 9,000 calorie workout or something. And the next day is Thanksgiving. And it's, it's kind of the best day of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, and then I ended up, I also won a national title senior year in the pair. So the pair is there's just two people in the boat um, rowing. You could have pairs, fours, eights. Four. I won't get too far into that. So that's that. Then I go to the Navy. Um, four years get, you know, not, not out of shape. We're working hundred hour weeks. You can't, I'm lucky if I got in two workouts a week, that kind of thing. Um, and then I got out of the Navy and one of my friends, um, he, he had done an Ironman. He was a, a rowing teammate and I didn't really know what Ironman was. I was 26 at this point and, but I knew it was long. And so I was like, well, you know, if Dan can do it, uh, you know, maybe I can too. Like, no, no disrespect to him, but you know, we were teammates, so I was like, oh, you know, kind of similar physically. Um, and so I signed up for Cordelaine and Placid 07 because uh, I was an idiot, and I was like, yeah, doing them a month apart should be fine. Uh, and I did them, and they were they were fine. You know, I suffered, and they were disgusting. And my nutrition was like payday bars and Red Bulls and caffeine pills. Like it was utterly insane. Um, but I went under 11 hours in both, like even though I was utterly clueless. So I was like, yeah, you know, maybe I'm not so bad. Um, and I met my buddy Ethan at Michigan, the one who ended up referring me to Jesse several years later. He was on the U.S. national team. And so we started training together. Um, one thing led to another and I was like, I could be pretty good. Uh, so I ended up, I was at Michigan at the time. I don't think I mentioned that. I ended up leaving Michigan with my masters and I moved out to Colorado. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go pro. And at this point I was a 28 year old and my Ironman PR was like a 1040, but I was just like, well, you know, I, I think I'm good. So I'm uh -huh. going to see if I can do it. And, uh, turns out I was right. Uh, um, and, and you know that's that I just kind of it just kind of went from there yeah so, so was, let me, yeah. just let me back up a little because there was a lot that you just packed in in there so mm -hmm. when did you start running biking swimming <laughs> like when I was 26 okay. I mean I had like taken swimming lessons as a kid okay. but I hadn't swam competitively and same yeah. thing like in college um I would enter like a, a 10 K or the Ithaca 10 miler. I would enter that every year and just, I didn't do any run training. I just did it on rowing fitness. And then growing up, um, you know, I just ride my bike around the neighborhood, but I had never done anything even resembling a bike race. Um, and so when I was 26, I just decided I was going to do triathlon and, and uh, kind of got pretty obsessed with them. Um, and, you know, I went through the struggles of being kind of an adult onset swimmer for sure. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think that's an asset as a coach because I know what it's like. You know, I'm not someone who is swimming juniors two hours a day, six days a week, starting at 10 years old. Like I just bought a copy of Total Immersion, the book, and I, I just did drills from that every day for like six months or eight months until I had like really good balance. I had a good catch. I had all this stuff. Um, it didn't make me a perfect swimmer, but it made me pretty good. Um, and then when I got to Jesse. And Tim, they yelled at me. They said, ah, Doug, you swim, you're swimming too much with the glide at the front, the total immersion, you know, which is fine. But like, once you get all those basics yeah. and the balance and the body position, getting rid of the glide at the front end, that was easy. Um, and I never became like a front pack swimmer, but you know, I was like solid second or third pro pack swimmer. Like, you know, I was okay. Um, but it, it, it does help me a lot uh, coaching all the adult onset swimmers we get for sure. 
uh, cause I just, I went through the exact same process. Yeah. yeah. So when you decided to do triathlon, you decided to do Ironman. That was all, that was one decision. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't right? know there was other distances. Okay. Yeah. 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 Usually we hear, oh, we signed up for a sprint race. And then I decided I'd like to know you just signed up for. Yeah. For yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of how that went. Okay. Uh, and, but you know, it worked out. So. And then how did you go from saying that you wanted to be a pro to earning your pro license? Um, that's, you know, the, the, a 10 <laughs> something Ironman's a great race, but it's not a pro race. So how no, do you, it's not even I, close. Like, like, how'd right? you make, yeah, so how'd you make that? Um, I, I put in three years of 25 hours a week. That's, that's it. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, and, and, and I just kind of, yeah, there's, there's no, you know, it's like, 90% of the things in life, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. You know, I just showed up every day. I did the work. I did what Tim told me. Uh, and, and I went to the races and I did my best and just kept chipping away. And then, then I got there. Yeah. So let me pull this timing together then. So yeah. what year, like relative to when you came to QT2, when did you earn your pro card? So I moved out to Colorado, December 08. Uh, that's when I started training full-time, even though I was, I was just an age grouper. Um, I came to QT2. I started, I was coached by Tim uh, starting, oh my God, did I get my years wrong? I did. Ah, I'm sorry. Okay. Everything was a year earlier. So okay. I started being coached by Tim fall of 09, not fall of okay. 10. And okay. then I started coaching spring of 10, not spring of okay. 11. Anyways, okay. nobody cares. Okay. It doesn't matter. Um, it was a while ago. Yeah. So Tim started coaching me fall of 09. Um, and my first marathon with him, like I had missed a Kona slot at Louisville by like two minutes. And then Tim started coaching me. And three months later, I got a Kona slot at Arizona. And I was like, okay, this is great. Um, and that was... That was November of 09. So I got my Kona slot then. Then I raced, you know, I did Coeur d'Alene next year. I raced Kona, October of 10. Um, and then I got my pro license the next year, June of 11. I won the amateur race at Coeur d'Alene. And that was awful. The water was 52 degrees. Anybody who raced it that year will tell you about it. It was brain freeze city. It was awful. Um, but I had a great day. And I just kind of did my thing, didn't really worry about anybody. And then um, I think I was oof, maybe 15th in my age group out of the water, I was eighth or ninth off the bike. And then I just ran everybody down, um, came across, got the amateur win. And so the total, so I moved out to Colorado. It was about two and a half years after moving out that I got my pro license, I would say. Okay. Yeah. And then as a pro, did, I mean, Iron Man. That was your focus as a pro. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the only thing I was competitive at. Yeah. You know, like I, I could go. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't like a local race or like a regional race, I just wasn't competitive at any distance other than Iron Man. Mm -hmm. Like I, I go enter a seventy point three, and I, I'd be a half an hour behind the winner. Like those guys are just stupid fast at that distance. You know. Yeah. And Olympic distance, forget it. I didn't have to swim to be competitive at that. So yeah, it was it was Iron Man or bust for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so so when we talk about the suffering scale, you're really right. yeah. into that. Like, don't get me wrong, I would have loved to race ITU. Like that looks yeah. super. I did a couple draft legal races and they were extremely fun. But like I just didn't have the swim to do it. So you got to race to your strengths, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So throughout your your career. Um, well, how long did you race pro for? When did you? Uh, it's again, like everything in my life, the timelines are really fuzzy. They make okay. sense to me because I live them. Um, but so I started racing pro June of 11. I got to 2016. I was like, this is crazy. I'm 36. I, I do not make a lot of money. I need to get a real job. Um, so I got a normal office job fall of 16. So I had a five-year span where I was doing nothing in my life but training and racing. And I was like a full-on, full-time pro. Uh, I got that office job, uh, fall of 16. And then I continued to race pro for another three years. Um, 
So technically my pro career was eight years, but in terms of, you know, those last three years, I was living an age group or lifestyle and just getting by on fitness that I had accumulated earlier in my life. Uh, yeah. So is there one race that you look back over your, your long, your long career and say like, that's super memorable to you that you think about? Um, yeah, I mean, Coeur d'Alene 11 when I, yeah. when I won the amateur, cause that was like, you know, I mean, it's 2,500 people and you go out, you beat all of them. And like, that was a really big deal. Cause I had like the entire, like last two and a half years of my life, um, you know, that, that, that was the entire focus and there, there's a YouTube clip of me somewhere. I, I have a link to it somewhere where me coming down the finishing shoot and like the announcer on iron, someone recorded it on my iron man live. I, I think it was Rick Brown, maybe. Um, and I was just going bonkers. Like I was dancing, I was spinning, I was hugging everybody. Um, and it was like, it was a really big deal, at least for me, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was the day where all the, I mean, back then, Mass Start Swim, you all were together. I so love, you, uh, so you knew you starts. won. Like there was right. no yeah. question. There's yeah. no ambiguity. Yeah. If you cross first, you win the race. That's yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I miss those mass starts. They were fun. Um, they were. Like, I get why they got away with, why they did away with them, but secretly I, I wish we went back to mass starts. Yeah, they, they are fun. I have a video from when I did my first triathlon Ironman in 2001. God, ages. Oh my. Many yeah, moons yeah. ago. And I have an old VCR tape of the swim and it looks like a flock of seagulls. Isn't it, it the coolest through. thing? Yeah. Yeah, like just, it's so the cool. I mean, of just, everybody going in. Oh, it's so yeah. cool. Mounds yeah. and mounds of people. Yeah, it's it's yeah, pretty yeah, yeah. wild. But yeah. you definitely, you know, to say that the swim is is a contact sport, I mean, it's an mm -hmm. understatement when you're talking about yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Pretty cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like getting, I have to go find that YouTube video of you. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drag that one down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I want to shift gears to the mm -hmm. other side, which is why really why you're here today, which is as a coach. So mm -hmm. following your, your timeline, you started coaching in the spring of 2010. Mm -hmm. And so you've been coaching now with QT2 for 13 years, roughly mm -hmm. 13 years. Um, yeah. So tell me a little about, um, about the athletes that you coach or that you like to work with, if there's anything that's consistent in there. No, I mean, just, excuse me, bubbles. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, as long as they, as long as they uh, have a good attitude, I don't, I don't really care. Um, they show up. Uh, that, that's, it's a really weak answer, but that's just kind of how it is. As long as they're not jerks, like great. And, and I haven't come across any jerks, so great you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is good <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I mean having interviewed a couple of your athletes on the journey I mean at the end of the day there's like there's nothing magical right you have right to, yeah and you have to put in the work yeah that's you do really those two things then you got a shot at it right you know pretty much yeah yeah just yeah about um and but but that's the hard pill to swallow a lot of people don't want to they want to chase you know, the, this, this biohack or that biohack, or, oh, we got to do this. I, I can do 20 hours a week of training in 10 hours. Like, no, you can't, you can do 10 hours a week of training in 10 hours. Like <laughs> That's not how math works. Uh, <laughs> and, and I lay that out for them and I let them know that it might be kind of boring at times. Um, but then again, if you find it boring, like, Maybe you just, th this is going to sound harsh and mean, but if you find it boring, maybe you just don't like it that much. Right. Um, like I, I do not find any workout I do boring um, because there's always something to think about when you're training. Like you can have four different zone one runs. You, you could have 20 zone one runs in a month and every single one of them is unique in its own way, whether it's different, you're, you're, 
trying something different with your footfall, trying something different with your breathing, trying something different with, you know, where you load the hills early in the run, late in the run, um, you know, trying different things with your arm carriage, anything like that. Uh, there's all these little variations. And then, you, you know, you're looking at like pace and, and heart rate, whether they stay together, whether they decouple, like, oh, what did the impact of this food I had two hours ago? How is that affecting my run? Um, and it's like, I mean, my mind is always going, uh, you know, hundred miles an hour, even if it's just its own one workout, um, you know, on the bike, you're thinking about, oh, what if I tweak my fit this way? Should I, you know, you get on Zwift, like, should I attack this hill or should I chill or, you know, whatever. Anyways, you get the point. Um, you, you find ways to make it interesting. Um, when, when you really like it and you're really just trying to learn about the sport and learn about yourself, I think. And that's not to say I give everybody all zone one all the time because I realize they're not robots. I just kind of got off on a tangent now. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you kind of made the point. It's like if you training for an Ironman is a really big commitment, you have to accept that it's a really big commitment. Right, yeah. And yeah. if you don't like putting in the time, then maybe it's not the right commitment for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it becomes uh, self-selecting, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm going to say that like from personal experience, because I started with Iron Man when I was first and then I went short course for years and I loved it. And then I felt compelled to go long course and trained again last year for my first Iron Man in 20 years. Oh, and oh I did not like it. I didn't like it. At <laughs> I was bored. The rides were too long. And for some people, they love it. But for me, I like totally itched for the short stuff again. So this year I was uh, in short course because yeah, that's well, for me, that's my yeah, spot. Good. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you gotta love it. Like those all day rides. I'm like, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> and yeah. last year this gorgeous place, but I'm like, yeah, and yeah. So, but you have to love it. If you make the commitment, you really have to want to do it. And, and, and to be clear, like when we say love it, it doesn't mean it's always fun, right? No, like no, of course. There's, there's this like idea, some people call it like uh, toxic positivity. It's like, they, it's like they built this idea in your head. If you're not smiling and chipper and happy all the time, then you're doing it wrong. Like, no, like there are times that it sucks. Like it's really awful. Like I like training, but it does make me miserable, but things that make you miserable, you can still like, if that makes, I'm sure you understand that. And, and a lot of people who do this understand that it's not to say it makes me miserable all the time, but sometimes it does. That's just part of the process. You go through it because you know, it's going to pass and, and you know, it's going to get better on the other end. Um, and getting through it honestly feels great. Like getting through a workout and doing well on a workout that you hate kind of feels a lot better than doing well on a workout that you love. Um, Cause yeah. you, you just gain that confidence, you gain that strength and, and it really becomes an asset on race day, I think, because just like in training, there are times it's miserable. Like if you go through a race and it's never miserable, like you're probably not going hard enough. Right. Uh, honestly, you know, um, well, I, it depends on your goals. If your only goal is to finish, like, sure, be happy all the time do what you want to do. But if your goal is to like be competitive, win the race, win your age group, you know, whatever, like you're going to have to go through some really kind of crappy periods. Um, and going through those in training will help you get through them in race day because you know through experience that there's a light at the end of the tunnel um, and you just have that confidence. You know? Yeah. That's why I love when I have like, I give a tough workout to one of my athletes and they write back and they're like, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do that, but I did this and it went really well. I was like, yeah, note mm -hmm. that, bring mm -hmm. that back because yeah, you know, you can do hard things. And once you realize you can do hard things, well, you know what? You do hard things. Right. And, exactly. Yeah. 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 hundred yeah. percent. And you can, yeah. and you can get through them, but, um, yeah. but at some level, even if a workout isn't enjoyable, the outcome is and where it gets exactly. You. Exactly. Right. And so yeah. somewhere in there, you know, you have yeah. to be like, this is why I'm doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not always fun, but it's always satisfying. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, that's for sure. So, um, so through the process, I mean, you, you've trained a bunch of people who've raced at the highest level. I mean, who've been to Kona. I mean, every year you have several athletes that do that mm -hmm. and successful athletes like any athlete have their doubts along the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you say to an athlete that comes to you and isn't sure if they're going to be able to do something that they've dreamt of doing or, you know, 
Um, and to do. Oh, I, I don't, I mean, for one thing, I never lie to them. You know, you can lie to an athlete once, but then once you do, it's over. They don't trust you anymore because they know you lied and anything you ever say again, they're just not going to believe you. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if, if an athlete has a goal and, and in my heart, I know that they can't realistically achieve that. I just say that. Mm-hmm. And I shift, I try to shift what their goal is. I try to really shift them to like process oriented goals rather than outcome oriented goals. And because, you know, say, say they want to get to Kona, right. And for whatever reason, they're just, their fitness is just not there. Um, if they line up on the starting line and I tell them like, oh yeah, you can get to Kona this race. Yeah, 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 yeah. About somewhere on the run, they're going to figure out that they can't get to Kona and they are just going to fall apart and the race is going to go down the tubes. Well, it's not really all that productive. Um, whereas if I give them process oriented goals, uh, they can kind of, they get there along the way. And instead of thinking about this thing that's unattainable, if you give somebody a goal that's unattainable, they're just going to get frustrated and they're going to quit. So you give somebody a goal that's attainable and maybe, no, maybe they don't get the corner, but maybe they only miss it by 20 minutes. And last time they missed it by 35 minutes and they see that improvement and that gives them the confidence. And I just say, well, you know, it wasn't your day, but you can see this improvement. You're getting real, real close. And um, a, cl- a real good example of this is the two athletes we had on that, that Kona series uh, uh, last fall were, were Derek and Damon. Like they came, they, it took them, I don't know, three, four years to get to Kona and they just kept inching closer and closer and closer. And so, no, they didn't achieve that ultimate goal, but I was able to give them these process oriented goals and show them that even though they didn't get their goal of Kona, there was very concrete evidence that they were getting closer. And if they, if they didn't have those process goals and if they had just quit in the race, when they realized they weren't getting to Kona, they wouldn't have seen that progress along the way. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yeah, no, it makes, it makes perfect sense. And they also wouldn't have believed that they could get right. Yeah. 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 Because instead of being 20 minutes, you know, they would have been an hour off and they would have been falling apart in a race. So exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and then there are, so, there are other athletes like, uh, I'll name drop here, Janine, like she, uh, Janine Fink out of Wisconsin. She, she often has doubts like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, God, I'm not going to do well this race. And like, literally all I have to do is like show her her results. <laughs> like, good Lord, Janine, <laughs> you wipe the floor with everybody, every race you're going to do. It's not like your body magically lost ability. Like you're going to go and you're going to kill everybody again. And you know what she does. Um, so sometimes that's all people need is just a reminder of their previous results and a reminder that human physiology doesn't drastically change in the span of like two weeks. Like you don't just lose all of your ability. Right? You know, okay. If you're sick, right. But, um, yeah. you know, talking within normal circumstances, sometimes it's really easy just like that. Yeah. 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 yeah but mentally they have to be, to believe that mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. because yeah. if your answer had been like, Oh yeah, no, your training wasn't very good. The last couple of weeks, you're sort of don't like that. Wouldn't have really, you know? Oh of, no. Like, uh, yeah. Even yeah. if, even if someone's training is crummy, as long as they're rested, they're probably going to like trend back towards the previous results. Yeah. Like, unless they're really, really deep in a hole, which is pretty unusual. Yeah. 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 So what would you say, um, as a coach is your biggest challenge? Teaching swimming remotely, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, adult onset swimmers. It is, it is difficult to teach somebody how to swim if you're not on deck. Um, I do my best. I, I put them through drills. I don't tell them the point of the drills. I ask them what they think the point of the drill is because uh, I figure that's the best way they're going to learn. And we go through it that way. Um, yeah. And then no, there, there are other challenges, but I'm always able to fix them. So I guess they're not really big challenges. <laughs> yeah. And then what would you say your biggest success is as a coach? Um, 
I like that several of my athletes have gone on to become coaches themselves. Um, so far, I can think of I can think of three. There's probably a couple more. Um, maybe I could. Oh, four George. So, anyways, there's at least four, um, and I like that because it shows. Like, I mean, that that's your point as a coach, right? Is to make is to empty your knowledge onto them, your process onto them. And it's, your job as a coach is to make yourself obsolete. And if I teach them how to coach and then they go have success with their athletes, then I know I did my job. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of like that. Yeah. That's great. So now lately you've done something pretty different in your life, right? Decide mm -hmm. to go back to school. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I was working at uh, EPA doing uh, like sewage treatment plant regulation, uh, which is fine. It's, it's a good agency. I, I kind of got really frustrated with the amount of bureaucracy involved and sorry, Reem, the amount of lawyers I had to deal with. <laughs> so <constantly. bad>. hey, <laughs> I'm retired now. <laughs> um, but everything we wrote had to go through like all these layers of legal review. And it was just like such a slow, frustrating process. Um, and we were sitting around during quarantine. Everybody's just working at home all the time. And I was talking to Lauren. Um, she was my girlfriend at the time. She's my wife now. Um, she was like, Doug, you seem very bored at your job. Like, what else could you do? Like, look for a challenge that would be challenging and interesting. And we go through all these things. And you know, she come, she's a, she's a nurse. So she kind of has this healthcare bias or uh, that makes it sound bad. It's not bad, obviously. Um, familiarity with healthcare. She's like, you could be a doctor. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's crazy. I didn't take any of the prereqs and I was an engineering major and I'm old and all this stuff. And <clears throat> she was like, no, nah, you should give it a go. And I was like, okay. So the beauty of COVID is <clears throat> all these colleges put their classes online on Zoom. And so I didn't have to go like walk to campus. Like it, it makes it plausible to have a full-time job and take classes because all that commuting time is erased, right? And so I just started taking prereqs at uh, uh, BU, Boston University. And then for some ungodly reason, I took organic chemistry at Harvard, which was a horrific mistake. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. I got through it. I passed. Um, I think because they were the only one like offering it online at the time I needed it and whatever. Anyways, so I get through those and then I'm like, okay, that's okay. I'll, I'll take the MCAT. And the MCAT went okay. And I was like, okay, well, I'll start putting in my applications and we'll see what happens. And, you know, it worked out and, and I got in. So yeah, I'm in medical school now I'm about seven months in. Uh, I, uh, I know a lot more than I did, but I'm still nowhere near knowledgeable enough to actually be a doctor. Um, There's a reason it's four years yeah. plus, plus, yeah. plus, you know, it's not, it's not a one day certification course. That's right. It is very much not, um, <laughs> but I like it and I'm still kind of, uh, narrowing down what I want to specialize in. Um, you know, and it's good. So yeah, I love it. Great. And uh, be a doctor at the back end of it and probably a better coach as a result of it. Just, I mean, we've been not only just stuff we learn bio principles in, in class and just, you see all these pathologies and injuries and all this stuff. Uh, we've been, I've been dissecting a cadaver for the last five months, which is pretty wild. We took out the heart a couple of days ago um, it is heart. Um, the heart is deceptively simple. There's like six things you have to remember about the anatomy. Now the function is not simple, but the anatomy is like this thing, this little ball of muscle with four chambers in it that like takes eight minutes to memorize is probably the second most important organ in our body. Like, wow. That's scary. But anyways, another tangent. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exciting. So yeah. a few more years, we'll come back to you as Dr. Doug. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah.
Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that, that, that will be wild for sure. Um, All right. Yeah, I'll finish school when I'm 46 and then finish residency at 50. So you've got uh, a couple decades left to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am uh, most of my classmates, like I'm the oldest one in my class, like by far. Uh, most of my classmates were born when I was in college. Um, it's a little weird, um, mm -hmm. but well, I shouldn't say that. It was weird for like the first couple of weeks. It was at least weird in my head, but now it's just like, whatever. These are just yeah. the people I go to school with, you know? Well, but like Iron Man, you make the, you wanted something, you made the commitment, you're going to put in yeah. the hard work. And at the end of the day, you're not going to be bored in your job, right? No. I mean, so not there every is. day is going to be great. Not every, but the process. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There is always, that. that's something I like is there is always something you don't know. Um, and so you never get bored. There's always something new you can learn. And I, and I really like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's exciting. On that note, I'm going to let you get back to your study and to keep yeah. on learning. And but I just really want to thank you for the, for taking the time to talk with us today. And oh, really yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it was fun. It. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. See you later.